So tonight, well, um, I'm going to talk a little bit of a riff on the book, which you can buy, um, Why Evolution is True, talk a little bit about the evidence for evolution. It's a consilience in the Wilsonian sense in that many strands of evidence come together. And segue, I guess, into the reasons why Americans don't like evolution so much, and you all know that. And at the end, we'll talk a little bit about religion and the dysfunctionality of American society. But most of it will be. <laughs> I didn't say that religion was the dysfunction, right? So it turns out it's not, but it's connected to that. And that's you know, something I'll talk about um, at the end. But I want to start with the facts. And this is a little bit about, about the American resistance to evolution. This is a paper that was published in 2006 by Miller et al. on Science, in which they ranked 32 countries in terms of the acceptance of their inhabitants of, of the theory of evolution. Actually human evolution. So the length of the blue bars, this is 100%, is the proportion of people who accept evolution. The yellow is people that aren't sure, and red is people who think evolution, or at least human evolution, is false. And you can see this Iceland and Denmark and Sweden are at the top with 80% acceptance, and things go downhill as you go further south in Europe. But the really embarrassing part is this, which is <laughs> where we fall. Out of 32 countries, we're number 31 with acceptance of evolution of, well, it says here about 40%, but it turns out that's actually way too high. But it's, nevertheless, it's a national embarrassment. The only country below us is, is a Muslim country, which is largely fundamentalist and has its own reasons for rejecting evolution. So this is an embarrassment. Imagine if you surveyed the countries of the world, or the technically advanced countries of the world, and you found out that only 40% of Americans accepted the germ theory of disease or the theory that matter was made up of atoms. You'd say there was a crisis in understanding or education. Well, here it is for something that's just as true as the theory of, of atoms and um, germs, which is the theory of evolution. And I'll try to persuade you tonight of the truth of this theory if you aren't already, although I suspect that most of you already are. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about the resistance to evolution. So here's another poll that was taken by, uh, last year by the Gallup poll in which a, a large sample of Americans was surveyed about how they thought humans came to be. They got three choices, either evolved from an earlier species, which is straight naturalistic evolution. You're created by God in the last 10,000 years, poofed into existence. That's young earth creationism. And human beings evolved, but that evolution was guided by God, either made the right mutations or installed the soul at the right point. And that's called theistic evolution. So here's the um, answers to that question. 40% of Americans were young earth creationists. 38%, which is surprisingly high in my view, accept evolution, but thought that God tweaked it. And 6% um, were unsure. Well, you can do the math and subtract for 100. Only 16% of Americans accept the way evolution the way we Americans understand, or we scientists understand it as a purely naturalistic, materialistic process. So that's one in six of your neighbors believes the way scientists do, or people who work in this museum. It gets worse if you ask Americans what they think should be taught to children in the public schools. They're given a choice of four, evolution only, creation only, intelligent design, or all three. And um, Again, you can do the math, 12, only 12%, 12 one in eight Americans think that only evolution should be taught in the schools. And the other, you're either unsure, but most of them think that some mixture of evolution and creationism should be taught. And in fact, whoops, sorry, the most misguided answer is this, all three. This is the American sense of fair play at work here. 55%. <laughs> Let the kids sort it out, okay? <laughs> it's like saying, okay, teach them astrology and astronomy and psychology and let them sort it out, who regulates human behavior. But it, it's pretty distressing. Um, if you guys think that because you're in Massachusetts, you're the best in the country and you're sophisticated about these things, well, you're pretty good. But if you grade the public school standards for teaching evolution in the school, various states, you can see here the South gets Fs and stuff. But Massachusetts only gets a B not an A. And the reasons for that are, first of all, Massachusetts state standards, at least according to this paper, disguises the fact that humans evolved. I don't know how they disguise it. <laughs> and second of all, that cosmological evolution, or the origin of the universe, is not taught until high school. It's what's put on. So for that reason, you guys are rated to B, which is OK compared to like Alabama and Texas. But you could do better. So do something about that disguised human evolution in your state schools. Okay, so of course the result of this suspicion and dislike of evolution amongst Americans is that it, it 
causes these incursions into the public schools at regular intervals in which creationist or intelligent design people try to get their theories taught to people. This is the Dover case, you're probably aware of this, in 2005, in which intelligent design was mandated to be taught in Pennsylvania high school, and there was a big brouhaha in the courts, and fortunately it was struck down as not science. But this happens, these brush fires occur at regular intervals in America in which creationists try to get their misguided views taught in the public schools. So to, to try to combat this, I wrote the book, which is, you can get, or join the museum, which is even better, and get a free copy, um, which lays out, hopefully in a non-confrontational, objective way, what the evidence for evolution was, trying to convince people that evolution was true so that this stuff wouldn't happen again. Now, it turned out that this is probably a misguided effort. There are certain branch of people in this country that you cannot convince with evidence, um, but I did the best I could. So for the next, say, 30 minutes or so, I'd like to talk about why evolution is true, the various lines of evidence for evolution, what it is. Um, the reason I wrote this book, besides just laying out the evidence, is sort of threefold. First of all, evolution is probably the supreme achievement of the human intellect, I think, even more so than calculus, because it tells us the true story of where we came from. And it's amazing recursion that this brain has figured out where this brain came from in the first place. It's a pretty marvelous thing when you think about it. Second of all, presenting evolution versus alternative, which is creationism, tells people how hypotheses are tested scientifically. How do you adjudicate these two views of the origin of the universe and life in the face of evidence? And finally, the evidence is pretty cool. I mean, a lot of the evidence is very intriguing. I'll try to show some of the more gee whizzy stuff tonight. So, um, and it comes from various areas of biology. It's drawn from, it's not just the fossil record. So I want to talk to you about why evolution is true. Um, I won't ask you to raise your hands because those who think that it isn't true aren't going to raise their hands, <laughs> but I'm sure there are at least a few people in here. And even if you accept evolution, I'd like you to know the reason why you should accept evolution, all the evidence for it. So to answer the question why evolution is true, first I have to tell you what we mean by truth in science. Since I'm telling you why the theory of evolution is true, I have to tell you what a scientific theory is to begin with. And then what the theory of evolution really is, because it's more than one thing. It's not necessarily what everybody thinks it is. And finally, the real stuff, the meat of the talk, the evidence why evolution is true. Okay. So what do we mean by a scientific claim being true? Those of you who practice science know the answer to this. We have no handle on absolute truth in science. There's no bell that goes off when we find a fact that says, okay, you've got the absolute truth now, <laughs> you can stop. It's always provisional. So the best definition of scientific truth that I can think of is actually one that Steve Gould, who used to work in the museum, constructed, which is basically an assertion for which there's so much evidence that it would be perverse to deny it. <laughs> I think that's a really, I mean, that's a really good way to define scientific truth. It doesn't mean that it's an absolute truth. It just means you'd be dumb if you didn't look at this evidence and say this is the reality of nature. Okay. And Here's a scientific truth. It's a theory as well, Adams. Scientific truth that infectious diseases are caused by um, viruses or bacteria. And what I'll try to convince you tonight is that there's just, there are just as many facts in support of evolution as there are of these other so-called theories as well. These things are theories at, and at once are scientific truths in the sense that you'd be dumb if you said you didn't think Adams that existed. You'd be dumb if you didn't think cholera was caused by a microorganism. You'd be dumb or perverse if you said that you didn't think evolution occurred, which of course is more than 40% of Americans. Okay, so, <laughs> I hate to say that, but, I mean, it's not really dumb in the sense of stupidity. It's, it's ignorant, well, I, I don't, we'll go into this at the end of the talk. <laughs> okay, so we always speak of the theory of evolution, um, just as we speak of the theory of atoms and the germ theory of disease. What do we mean by a scientific theory? Creationists always dismiss evolution. You've heard this yourself. It's just a theory. Ronald Reagan did this in 1980. It's only a theory. I think that there are other things that are just as good. But a scientific theory is more than a hypothesis. I mean, a, a hypothesis or a guess. A hypothesis or a guess is something like the Celtics are going to win the playoff, um, which is not a very good hypothesis or a guess. <laughs> but a theory in science means more than that. It's a coherent group of propositions meant to explain facts around, about the world. So when we sit, talk about the theory, germ theory of disease, it is that the facts that we know about how diseases are transmitted point to microorganisms as the cause. Atoms are pointed to as the cause from many, many different lines of evidence as the fundamental chemical constituents of matter. 
So that's why we still call it the, the atomic theory and the, and the germ theory of disease. But you, none of you doubt the fact that matter is made of atoms, or I hope, um, that infectious diseases are caused by microorganisms. The, and the theory of evolution is just like that. It's a group of propositions, which I'll outline in a second, meant to explain facts about the real world. Okay. What's the difference between a theory and a fact? Steve Gould talked about this and extensively in his natural history columns, and there is no difference, at least in my view. A theory is a set of propositions to explain facts about the real world. When a theory accumulates a certain amount of evidence that supports it, as we have for the theory of atoms, the theory of germ theory of disease, and the theory of evolution, then it graduates to facthood. Okay. So basically, when you say, I say evolution is a theory, you can also say it's a fact at the same time. And it is. And I'll give you the evidence, which is in this arrow here. Okay, so what is the theory of evolution, the Darwinian theory? I mean, the theory of evolution is many things. Um, number one being the one that you think it is, which is that evolution happens. That is, organisms evolve. As evolutionary geneticists, I define that as genetic change in populations over long periods of time. Okay, but there's actually five parts to the theory of evolution. And if you want to say it's true, you have to say that all five parts are true. Okay. So there's part two, which is that it's usually gradual. And by gradual, I don't mean, you know, it takes gazillions of years for evolution to occur, but I mean it does not happen overnight. It takes hundreds or thousands or even millions of years for appreciable genetic change to happen in populations. Okay. These parts of the theory don't all stand or fall together. You can have evolution, for example, but it doesn't have to be gradual. So you have to support each of these pillars independently. Speciation occurs. This is my area of expertise. It's more than just evolution. You have to have a lineages which branch to create descendant species. Um, if we had, this branching had not occurred, we'd still only have one highly evolved species with us today, the descendant, the lineal descendant of the first organism. But we have at least nine million species on Earth today, and that's because this branching process has occurred, and it's happened so profusely that now we have to represent the tree of life by this sort of circle of life, and that even this is compressed considerably. There's the ancestral organism right there of all species, and then it's just branched into these gazillions of things here through the branching process. So we have to support that too. Okay. Now, the process that organisms split, the idea split, leads to the converse that if you trace any pair of organisms back in time, in this branch here, for example, B and C, if you trace them back in time, you're going to find a single ancestor that was their common ancestor, the so-called missing link. So part four of evolution is that all species share a common ancestry. You can pick any two species on Earth, like a fern and a squirrel, and, some, and we can now trace back approximately when that common ancestor lived between these two species and when it lived using molecular data. But this, of course, this splitting process and this common ancestry has to be supported independently. Here's the, the common ancestry of humans and the primate lineage. Uh, we share a common ancestry with chimps about 7 million years ago, with uh, gorillas about 10, orangutans about 13. That what we mean by being most com closely related to something means that our common ancestor with that thing existed more recently. So we're more closely related to chimps than we are to gorillas because our common ancestor with the chimps lived more recently than our common ancestor with the gorillas. You probably know all this stuff, so my apologies if I'm preaching to what you already know. And finally, the last part of the, the pillar of the theory of evolution is the idea that much of evolutionary change, although not all of it, is caused by the process of natural selection, which I will assume you know or have an inkling of because it uh, takes too long to describe. The, it is the only force, it's not really a force, it's what happens, it is the only um, process that occurs that gives organisms the appearance of being adapted to their environments. The marvelous fish, fins of the fish, the beak of the woodpecker, the spines of the cactus, and so on. And again, this is independent of what I said before. You can have all this stuff, points one to four, occurring, and yet it might not have occurred largely by natural selection. There are other kinds of evolutionary processes that have been proposed to cause both adaptation and evolution. So these are the five pillars of the theory of evolution, and I'm going to try to support all of them in the, the talk. So what is the evidence? Evolution is a scientific theory. Uh, most good scientific theories make predictions about what you should find if they are true, and that is also true of evolution. The first one, which is the ob most obvious one, is if life originated on Earth in the distant past, this is Jack Shostak's area of expertise, and evolved, we should see that the first organisms on Earth were very simple, at least the first fossilized ones, and that as time passed, organisms um, on average became more complex. 
and that the organisms that you find most recently in the fossil record would be the ones that most closely resemble the things that are on Earth today that are alive, because they're the ancestors of those things. You know this, this is the geologic column. You can see it from the Archean to the Quaternary, um, back from the origin of the Earth at 4.6 billion years ago to the recent times. The earliest traces of life occur at 3.6 or 3.5 billion years ago. And those are stromatolites, um, blue-green algae, which they used to be called, you know, they're known as cyanobacteria. They're these things. So the earliest forms of life that we do see fossilized about 3.5 billion years ago are indeed simple. Life obviously originated way before that, but the first things we see are there. And then as you go up, you see other forms coming in, fish, land, plants, and perhaps things that we see mo find more complex uh, towards the top. You don't see humans down here. You don't see dinosaurs up here. This is in line with what evolution predicts. Okay. Other predictions. There's speci uh, speciation. Okay. So lineage is sometimes split. We should be able to find examples of this splitting in the fossil record. And we should be able to find examples of common ancestry in the fossil record. Well, it's not that easy to find one lineage splitting into two in the fossil record, since it usually happens relatively quickly. But we do have evidence. And in fact, we've seen new species arise in a human lifetime. Here's an example of a new species arising in 1.7 million years. It's a diatom, a marine organism, which has a really good fossil record because when they die, they just sink to the bottom of the ocean and are covered by sediments. You stick a tube down in the ocean floor and pull it up, and there you have a record of millions of years of evolution by cutting into the core. So this is the diatom. One characteristic, the height of the, organism, of the, height of the highland area, it's like this length in micrometers, and this is the age. So we're going up towards more recent times over a period of 1.7 million years. And you can see here that we see evolutionary change that sort of bounces around. It's not directional, but it is indeed evolutionary change, and it's gradual. But I've left off part of this graph. If you actually look at the core carefully, you will see here's a splitting event, where this thing actually split at this point, or somewhere around there, into two different species, that one of them that became smaller in size, maybe because these were competing for food. Here's some fossil evidence for splitting. If you want, now people aren't impressed by diatoms, they want something more, they want a big charismatic organism. So here's the horse. We have a really good record of horse evolution, which mostly occurred in western North America, at least that's where the fossils are. And um, over a period of time, I think it's probably 25 million years, but I can't be sure about that, we start with a small animal about that big, Hyracotherium, and we can trace at least one lineage up to the modern horse there, in which there's substantial evolutionary change going on. Loss of toes, this one had four. The toes gradually shrink and get smaller and smaller and smaller until we have only one toe in the modern horse, which is actually the, horse, the hoof of the horse. It's walking on its single toe, the metatarsal. Um, and there are other lineages as well. Lots of things are going on besides the loss of toes here. The animal is getting bigger. The teeth are getting bigger because it has to deal with grass, since the forests are being replaced by grassland. So there's all kinds of major evolutionary change going on. And you see gradualism, you see evolutionary change, and you see splitting all in this branch of horse evolution. You can see it's not a simple lineal descendant of, from Hyracotherium to this horse. It's a branching pattern, just like our own ancestry of humans. Okay? Evolution makes further predictions. If creatures share common ancestry, then we should be able to find evidence of common ancestors for different species that live on Earth today. Um, and here's one that was predicted in Darwin's time by, um, by Thomas Henry Huxley, who observed that there were certain similarities between birds and reptiles. Um, they both lay eggs. There's similarities of their circulatory system and the way their hearts are constructed. And so Agassiz, I mean, sorry, Huxley and, and his contemporaries suspected that because they, we knew that reptiles were down there in the fossil record, but there were no birds 300 million years ago, that birds descended from reptiles. Okay. So that's a prediction that was made before we had any fossils to test it. What you want to look for, ideally, is the missing link. The missing link is that single species of reptile which gave rise to all modern birds on one hand and all modern reptiles on the other. So creationists will say, find us that species. And if you can't, you're out of luck. But evolution does not require that you find a single link to show that birds descended from reptiles. You don't need to do that. What you can do is find early birds, or the lineal ancestors of birds, that have reptilian characteristics at about the time that this branching is supposed to have taken place. So we don't really, when they say the missing link is still missing and therefore we don't have evidence that birds descended from reptiles, that's a wrong 
That's a false requirement. It's a, it's a too strict requirement. Um, in fact, creationists say this all the time. <laughs> and I make fun of this. I've, heard, I've been at lectures by creationists where they'll say, well, those stupid evolutionists tell us that birds evolved from reptiles. Well, OK, if you believe that, then this is what you're going to have to look for in the fossil record. This is called a <laughs> crocoduck. Um, <laughs> It's a crock of something, but I'm, <laughs> there it is. But you don't need this. Because, I mean, okay, and, and I've been in audiences where the creationists will laugh and say, those stupid evolutionists, how could they think something like that? And they'll wave their Bibles if they have them. Um, but in fact, we do have something like this, but it's even better because it is the real intermediate form between modern birds and reptiles. And here's one example. There's been in the last 20 years a huge number of <laughs> fossil finds, mostly from China, of um, things that are sort of half reptilian and half bird. And here's one of them, Cyanornithosaurus millennii, which dates back to about 125 million years in the fossil record, which is after dinosaurs had already been in existence for some time, but before we find modern birds. So it's right where you'd expect it to be. Um, basically, this thing that you're looking at, you can't tell whether it's a bird or a reptile. It's very similar in its skeleton to what the theropod dinosaurs. And here's theropod dinosaurs. You've seen them from um, Jurassic Park with these fast-running bipedal dinosaurs that might have been hot-blooded and were vicious. And some of them were quite small and bird-like. And here, their skeletons look almost like this one here. You can see the skeleton, Cyanornithosaurus. Um, it has dinosaurian characteristics. Very, it looks very much like a theropod. It has teeth. You can't see them so well. There's a tooth there. Its fingers are unfused. If you look at your chicken wings, fingers are fused. They're, they're not like that. This is reptilian. And it has this long bony tail. And you know from looking at the pope's nose and your turkey that no bird has a long bony tail. But there are these things. And they're feathers. These are impressions of feathers. This thing was a feathered reptile. Well, some cladist is going to take issue with me here. A feathered thing which is similar to theropod dinosaurs, but has this new addition here. And it probably looks something like this. It appears at the right time in the fossil record, 125 million years ago. It probably looks something like this. Um, and and the is, uh, I think it was in Nature or Science a couple weeks ago, they found an even earlier form of something like this, in which it was basically a dinosaur, but it had thin filaments of feathers on the thing. So feathers probably did not evolve to help these things fly. They evolved for other reasons, perhaps due to um, thermoregulation or species recognition or other reasons. But at any rate, what better thing can you have to show that birds evolved from reptiles? It's prediction that has been verified by many, many fossils like this. Here you have a dinosaur, a reptile, that has feathers. Okay. This is the crocoduck that creationists are always saying that we don't have. Whales are another story. Uh, in the last 30 years, whales were another mystery. I remember going to a lecture by Duane Gish, a famous creationist. Um, at the University of California, in which he said, well, these stupid evolutionists tell us that whales evolved from, from artiodactyls, which are animals like cows. They're, uh, they're even-toed mammals. And he said, well, what would that require? And he showed a picture of an animal. The front half was a Jersey cow, and the back half was a fish. And it was standing on the edge of the water. It had a question mark over its head, like, what am I? And all the creationists laughed in the audience. It's a stupid scientist. Well, okay. we didn't have the fossils then. So all we could say is we're pretty sure that whales evolved from tetrapods because there's so many affinities genetically and morphologically between artiodactyls, even toed animals, and modern whales. Well, people have filled in this gap in the last 20 years. This is one of the most remarkable examples of an evolutionary prediction being fulfilled. Here's, well, first of all, we found something that looks very much like the common ancestors of whales. It's like the muntjac the small deer of Southeast Asia that's known to dive in the water to escape from predators and stay underwater for several minutes. We have this thing called Indohyus, which is very much like a muntjac, but it has certain ear structures which make us think that this is indeed the animal that gave rise to modern whales. And then we found all these things. We have a series going back, starting 50 million years ago and going to 42 million years ago, of things which progressively become less and less deer-like and more and more whale-like. Their limbs shrink, their front limbs turn into flippers, their rear limbs go away, the nostrils move at the top of the head to form a blowhole. All kinds of, the ears change so that there's no external openings. There's all kinds of modifications going on. And we have all these intermediate forms now that show this progressive loss. Here's one of them. I, I think this is Rhodocetus, um, but I'm not absolutely sure you can look, find it in the book. Um, and so this happened over a period of 8 million years. That's a remarkably fast rate of evolution. We evolved 
from our ancestors from chimpanzees. It took us about seven million years of divergence. This is about the same amount of time, so eight million years, to go from a deer to a whale. Now, if you, and we have the transitional form. So when creationists say we don't have one thing, one kind evolving into another kind, you cannot say that this and that are the same kind of animal, whether you use biblical kinds or species. Here we have a major evolutionary transition that's been documented, but was predicted and documented by fossils. And this is probably the best thing that's happened since Darwin is the efforts of paleontologists to confirm him. We have fossil record of fish transforming themselves into amphibians. Tiktaalik, you've probably heard of Neil Shubin's work. We have amphibians turning into reptiles, reptiles turning into mammals and reptiles turning into birds, and of course the human fossil record, which was posited by Darwin to exist in Africa in 1871. There were no early fossils then, probably the most dramatic evolutionary prediction that has been succeeded, and sure enough in the 1920s they began turning up human ancestry, in, in, uh, beginning with Australopithecus in South Africa. Okay. So we have all these predictions of the theory of evolution that have been verified. We have common ancestry, we have gradualism, we have genetic change in populations, and we have speciation. Um, but there's also what we call retrodictions, things that make sense only in light of evolution but aren't necessarily predicted by evolution. There are all these biological puzzles in embryology, in morphology, and in physiology that people couldn't understand until Darwin's theory of evolution. And it was Darwin who first deduced most of this evidence in 1859. Here's one of them. This is a dolphin embryo, spotted dolphin embryo at 24 days. If you know your embryology, can everybody, everybody see this? Okay, I guess you can see it over there. Um, these are the limb buds. This is the front limb. This is the hind limb. This is, looks remarkably like a human embryo, which is more evidence for evolution. This thing develops into the flipper. But why is there a hind limb bud? Why do dolphins have this thing? They don't have hind limbs. You can see that right there. There's nothing there, right? Well, why? It's because we now know from both fossil and molecular evidence that dolphins descended from land animals that had four legs. And what we see here is a remnant in development of that hind limb beginning to develop. Here it is in a tetrapod which still has its hind limbs. Okay, that's the hind limb bud. Tetrapod that still has its limbs and keeps its limbs until a dolphin. This is a human embryo at about the same age, 30 days. Four limb, hind limb bud, see in the same place. This becomes your arms. This becomes your legs, there's one on each side. In the human embryo, this continues to get bigger and forms your arms. This continues to get bigger and form your legs. In the dolphin embryo, that hind limb bud goes away. It starts developing and then it disappears. Okay, so you have to ask yourself, why would a creator <laughs> make a dolphin embryo that starts to develop legs, but then aborts them at a certain stage of development? It doesn't make any sense under the hypothesis that was going in Darwin's time, which was creationism. It makes sense under the hypothesis that this animal evolved from something that had four legs, and it shows the remnants of that ancestry in a certain stage of development, Whoops! but then aborts them um, before it turns into the dolphin. So this, these become flippers, and these things go away. Occasionally, however, you have an atavism in a dolphin. A dolphin will be born with hind limbs. Very, very rare. Here's one of them turned over. You can see there they are, right there, sticking right out. Um, and if you look at them, they will have the bones of the hind limbs in them. So the genetic information is still there, but it's been repressed by evolution. Okay. That's the hind limbs of the dolphin. Whoops. Sorry. Okay. Here's another thing, um, thing that doesn't make sense. How many of you are aware that babies get hairy at some point in their development. Do you know that? You all were hairy at the age of about six months. You developed this thick coat of hair called the lanugo in utero, okay, and then it gets shed before you're born. It just falls off into the embryonic fluid. Unless you're born premature, which this infant was, and then the baby is covered with hair. Fortunately, that hair is shed as well. But you have to ask yourself, if you're a creationist, why would the creator put hair on a human embryo and then get rid of it? I mean, one possible answer is, well, it keeps it, keeps it warm, right? Well, you know that you don't need to keep warm in the womb because it's thermoregulated at 98.6 in there. You don't need hair. The answer to this question of why we have this is perfectly understood if you realize that we evolved from animals that were hairy and were born hairy, i.e. apes. We're the naked ape, but we still show our ancestry from hairy apes at this stage of our development, which is the same stage in which embryonic apes develop coats of hair. It's just that we begin to develop it and then we abort it, okay? If you go upstairs in the MCZ, you will see skeletons of whales and sperm whales, one like this. 
Next time you do that, or if you just walk over, I'm not sure what the building is, um, right? Northwest. Northwest building, okay. Just look through the windows in there, and you'll see three skeletons, a killer whale, and two other kinds of little whales. And if you look closely, you'll see those things. You'll see two little bones hanging down, suspended by wires from the skeleton. They're not part of the skeleton in that they don't serve a structural function. In fact, they're embedded in the muscle. What are they, and why are they there? They don't make any sense because they don't seem to have any function. And if you're a creationist, and remember, we're testing two hypotheses here, which are still, amongst most of Americans, opposing hypotheses, um, evolution versus creation. Well, it's because, as I said before, whales evolved from animals that had hind legs. These are the remnants of the hind legs and the pelvis that the whale used to have. So next time you go to a museum and look at a whale skeleton, look for these little bones hanging down from wires, and you'll see right there evidence that only can be explained by evolution. Sometimes there's an atavism. This is a humpback whale that was found by the famous explorer Roy Chapman Andrews back in the 20s or 30s. And sometimes a, w a whale will be born with a couple of feet of legs sticking out right in the right place. And this is when you, do an a when you dissect them, you'll see the bones that are recognizably bones of the legs. You'll see the femur, um, the tibia, and the tarsus bones. And you can see the scale of this. This is about two feet long. Okay, how do you explain the fact that whales still have genetic information that makes them, that enables them to make hind legs only evolution because they evolved from animals that had hind legs, okay. You can make a further prediction from what we know about genetics and evolution now about what we would expect to see when we sequence the genome of an animal, which has only been possible in the last 20 years or so. When a structure disappears like the hind legs of the whale um, or the hair of the humans, the way evolution does it, it doesn't just snip out the gene from the DNA saying, okay, I'm going to take away the, the leg genes now, <laughs> remove them from the DNA. That's not the way it happens. What happens is those genes get silenced by mutations, and that makes the character disappear. So we can predict that in our genome, or in the genome of many species, we will find genes that no longer function, but that were functional in an ancestor, are no longer useful for that organism evolutionarily, and therefore have been silenced. But the, the DNA still remains as sort of a silent witness to our ancestry. Now, here's a human embryo again at the age of four weeks, and this is one of the silent witnesses that I'll talk about. Um, this is both a vestigial or a non-functional trait and a non-functional gene. Here's the human embryo. So what is this thing here? It's, any of you guess? It's the yolk sac, <laughs> okay. We don't have yolk. Chickens have yolks. Reptiles have yolk. We're descended from reptiles way back when. Um, we, we still form a yolk sac. There's nothing in it. It's as empty as a child's balloon at Park Street. Um, there's nothing in it. And yet we still form it. It has no function. Why do we do that? It's a remnant of what we had when we were reptiles. But you, now that we can sequence human DNA, and this just appeared, I guess, about a year ago, we find that we have the genes for making the proteins that used to fill up the sac in our DNA. We still have three genes to make yolk in the human genome but they're dead. They've been, non, they've been silenced by mutations. Okay, now how can a creationist answer that question? Why do we have these genes in the first place? Unless we, at one point, they were active in one of our ancestors and have since been silenced. We not only have dead genes for making yolks, we have dead genes for making vitamin C. Humans don't eat vitamin, I mean, we, the reason we need vitamin C, we have to take it in our diet, why sailors get scurvy, is because we can't make it ourselves, but almost every other species of mammal can make vitamin C. We need to get it in our diet. Presumably we got enough of it in our diet when we were apes and fruits and stuff that we didn't need the synthetic pathway for making vitamin C. And so we don't use it anymore. In fact, that pathway is still in our DNA. But the last step in the pathway, the gene that makes the last transition from one molecule to the vitamin C that we need is dead. Okay, it's gone. And it's inactivated by the very same mutation that inactivates the gene for making vitamin C in gorillas and chimpanzees, which also cannot make vitamin C. Now, how do you explain that? Why would the creator endow us with a fully-fledged biochemical pathway and then wipe it away with a single mutation and yet keep it in our DNA? You cannot explain that in any other way except we have common ancestry with animals. Same with the genes that enable us to smell. We have hundreds of them. But the vast majority of our olfactory receptor genes, and this was um, a Nobel Prize was awarded for this work um, several years ago, the vast amount of genes that we have that enable us to smell are dead. We are organisms that rely on our sight and hearing to apprehend our environment, unlike a lot of our ancestors or relatives like cats and dogs. 
So if you look at the, gen the DNA of our genome and look, compare it to the DNA of a dog or a cat, you'll see that dogs and cats have lots of different genes enabling them to smell different molecules. We have those same genes too, but they're dead. They're inactive. They've been rendered useless by mutations okay, because we don't need them. So our, our genome is a graveyard of dead genes that testifies to our ancestry. The last line of evidence for evolution, um, retrodictions, and again, this was made by Darwin in, um, in Origin of Species. Much of this evidence was first apprehended by Darwin. The vestigial organs, the embryology, these were all loose facts floating around in the journals of biology that nobody had ever thought to say, well, what does this mean? Does it, it only makes sense if, and then the if was the origin of species. And he had two chapters in that book on biogeography, which is the distribution of plants and animals on the surface of the planet. Okay? Um, and I just, I don't have time to go over this in great detail, but this is, to me, one of the most compelling bits of arguments for evolution that was made. And Darwin was justly proud of this. He thought that biogeography and embryology, because he didn't have a fossil record then, were the two killer points of evolution. So what are the facts about biogeography? Um, well, I'll just talk about one area, which is what we see on islands, in particular oceanic islands, which we define as islands that were formed from below the sea and appeared without any life on them. Volcanic islands, for example, like Hawaii or the Galapagos, or coral reef islands like Bermuda. These are known as oceanic islands because when they first appeared, nothing was on them. Those are in contrast to what we call continental islands like Britain and Madagascar and New Zealand, islands that used to be part of continents but then floated away from them due to plate tectonic movement. So here's Lord Howe in the South Pacific. It's a small island, but it's famous because it has lots of endemic species on it. And this is the thing that Darwin noticed, that for oceanic islands that were formed de novo, as opposed to continental islands, they had lots of weird endemic things on them, but they were lacking certain things. And oceanic islands, for example, like Lord Howe, do not have any endemic, which means endemic means found only in that place, mammals, reptiles, amphibian, and freshwater fish. Okay. And this is a general characteristic that Darwin noted. I mean, everybody knew this back then. Well, not everybody knew it, but if you went to the scientific literature, you would see, well, I went to Hawaii and there were no native mammals there. <laughs> or I went to the Galapagos and there's no freshwater fish. But those, those facts have not been collated or put into a synthetic framework. Hawaii has no endemic amphibians, reptiles, mammals, or freshwater fish. Okay. Plenty of insects, plenty of plants, plenty of birds. But it lacks these things. Okay, why is that? Same with the Galapagos. The Galapagos has a couple of reptiles. It has the tortoises and the well, this marine iguanas, but it doesn't have any endemic mammals. It doesn't have any endemic amphibians, no endemic freshwater fish. How do you explain that? Continental islands like Great Britain or New Zealand um, have, pl or have plenty of these things on them. So there's these major kinds of animals missing from oceanic islands. So how do you explain that if you're a creationist? And the creationist, well, I know the creationist mindset so well that I could <laughs> pretend I'm one. And, and they'd say, well, the Lord did not see fit to put these things on the islands because these islands are unsuitable habitat for things like amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and fish. OK, so how do you test that assertion? Well, Darwin, it was Darwin who did that. He just observed that when you introduce these things to the islands, they do really well. Here's two of them that did really well in Hawaii. If you've been to Hawaii, this, the first time I went to Hawaii, this nearly um, scared the hell out of me. I was driving down the road, and this thing ran across it, a mongoose. And it turned out they'd been, uh, they had been introduced to control snakes, which had been introduced accidentally, and they were eating all the native birds. And mongoose are doing really well in Hawaii, thank you. And here's another one, an amphibian introduced in Hawaii. It's the cane toad, which you know from the movie The Cane Toad, if you've seen that has taken over Hawaii. So as Darwin pointed out, these islands are, are suitable habitat in many ways for these animals and plants. They just don't occur there. Why is that? Obvious. How, did they, how could they have gotten there in the first place? And that is um, the reason why on islands we see plenty of plants, birds, and insects. Plants can float across to a newly formed island, or they can be crapped out by birds. In fact, many island plants are actually crapped out by birds that are flown from the mainland. That's why there are so few trees on islands, because tree seeds are too big for most birds to eat. Um, and birds, of course, can fly to an island. Insects can fly or be blown. So there's plenty of this stuff on the islands. There's so little of that stuff. Darwin pointed out, well, that makes sense if these endemic things that live on islands 
were descended from things that got there by overwater transport. And it's hard for a mammal, and even harder for a reptile or an amphibian, much less a freshwater fish, to get 600 miles across the um, ocean to get to the Galapagos. Okay. And the final sort of nail in the coffin and biogeography is if you look at the species on an oceanic island and you look where else in the world are the species that are similar to them, they're on the nearest mainland. And Darwin pointed this out for the Galapagos. If you're standing on the Galapagos, he said, you will feel an affinity with the flora and fauna of the, the western part of South America. Okay, why is that? Because these animals in the Galapagos descended from the animals in South America, despite the fact, how many of you have been to the Galapagos? Fair number. You know, if you've been there, you know it's nothing like the west coast of South America in terms of habitat. It's dry, rocky, lava habitat with not much water. The west coast of South America is rainforest. It's wet. So it's not a similar in habitat that makes the animals in the Galapagos resemble those of the South American mainland. It's because they descended from them. It's their ancestors that came over water. Okay. So I dwell on this at some length just to show you because I've never heard a creationist even try to explain this evidence. They just sort of turn their heads and pretend it doesn't exist. The last prediction of evolution is that we have bad design. Okay. This is a, uh, if you're my age, then you will be aware of this bad design. Um, fortunately, I have not yet experienced it, but I know it's going to happen because of this. Well, sorry, because I see this on television every night. <laughs> and I see men running from their golf carts to the restroom, so I know <laughs> what's in store for me. Um, if you know the way natural selection works, it takes what's there and modifies it into something else. Okay, so the flippers of the whale come from the front limbs of, of land-dwelling tetrapods, and that's why they still have separate digits and things. And so you don't expect evolution to result in a perfect design. It's jerry-rigged process because you're constrained with taking what was there before and going to something new, but every step in that process has to be adaptive because that's how natural selection works. So, um, so you predict that organisms are full of bad design. The, the, the cliche case is the appendix. I'm not going to talk about that. How many of you have had appendicitis? Okay. So you'd be dead if you were lived before surgery. I think 15% of Americans get them. Bad design. Okay. Creationists will say, well, it might help the immune system a little bit. It doesn't help the immune system enough to compensate for those 15% of people that would be dead. Um, with their appendix. So that's, a, that's the cliche example. I like the prostate better because not, not so many people know about it. Prostate gland, um, as you probably know, is a gland which is, um, in males is um, next to the, ure the um, bladder. It surrounds the urethra, which is the tube through which urine flows. The prostate gland produces seminal fluid, the fluid that helps uh, the sperm um, be transmitted down the stuck, and it's, it's, a, it's a gland that surrounds the urethra. Okay. The problem with this design is that this gland is prone to swelling in later age. I won't ask you to raise your hand if this has happened to you, <laughs> but it will if you're a male, or at least I don't know what the statistics are. I don't want to look them up, but I know if, they got to be common because it's on TV so every night. <laughs> Okay, so at about a certain age, your prostate gland enlarges. When it enlarges, it cuts off the urethra. It squeezes this tube, and you can't urinate, and it's painful. And you all know about this, um, and that's why you have this stuff. That is a bad design. You do not put an organ prone to swelling around a collapsible tube if you're an intelligent designer. You put it somewhere else, okay? <laughs> Robin Williams noted this in one of his movies. I can't remember the name of it. It wasn't one of his better movies where he becomes the president of the United States accidentally. He's asked to pronounce on intelligent design, and he says, intelligent design, um, just look at the prostate gland. Look how it's designed. It's like running a sewage pipe through a playground, um, <laughs> which is, in fact, what this is. So, um, so I could give lots of examples of this, but you know, it's in my book. Buy my book, and you'll read a whole chapter on this stuff. Um, Okay, so, and finally, the last prediction, I can't go into this in detail, the one that creationists love to do is, if evolution or adaptation results largely from natural selection, then we should be able to find examples of natural selection operating in nature. In Darwin's time, we didn't have any, really. He used artificial selection, selective breeding, as an analog for natural selection. But we really want to do more than just watch a rose turn into it, and a rose that has more petals or turns a different color. We want to actually see that happening in nature because artificial selection, although it's a very good analog of, 
of natural selection is mediated by human choice. We want to see it actually happening. Well, we now have enough cases to show that it is quite common in nature. We've had 300 cases, at least, that are pretty well known. Um, they're all documented, or at least a lot of them in this book. This is actually old now, in the 70s. We have a lot more cases of natural selection in the wild by John Endler. And the m most famous case that we pr you're probably aware of is that of the medium ground finch in the Galapagos, Geospiza fortis, which um, underwent a drought. The big seeds, juicy seeds that, um, sorry, the, the juicy small seeds that it used to live on before the drought died, all those plants died, it was forced to deal with big seeds that were tough to crack, and sure enough, the animal evolved. Um, the population underwent a transformation in which its beak got 10% bigger in one year, okay? This is natural selection. That's a lot of evolutionary change. I mean, if you extrapolate it to like a million years, it would have a beak bigger than the moon, okay? That's, that didn't happen, of course, but I mean, it is a case of evolution that's been well documented. It's described in this book, The Beak of the Finch by Jonathan Weiner, which won the Pulitzer Prize, um, deservedly so. Okay, so summing up the evidence for evolution. First of all, um, we have all these different lines from different areas. We have a fossil record which shows gradualism, change, splitting, and common ancestry. That's four out of the five requirements for the theory of evolution to be supported. We have the existence of vestigial organs, a completely different field of biology, our appendix, um, the whale's pelvis. We have these weird quirks of development like the lanugo in humans and the um, rear limb buds in dolphins. We have the examples of bad design like the prostate gland, our spines, the painful childbirth that human females are forced to endure because of the constraints of their pelvis and our need for a big brains biogeography, a completely different area of evidence, and examples of natural selection in nature. So we have all this stuff, all each of these from a different area of biology. What does that mean? It means that you're perverse if you don't put this stuff together and say that evolution is true. Okay. Now, there are conceivably some facts that could show that evolution was wrong. I've made a list of them. I mean, like all things, evolution is a provisional truth. There are some things that could convince me, at least, that it didn't happen. Now, that we don't have any of that evidence, but I just want to make a list to show you that we're aware that this theory could be falsified. Um, fossils in the wrong place. I mentioned humans in the Precambrian. If you had an adaptation of one species that was good only for another species, for example, if you found a nipple on a female mole that could only be used to suckle a mouse, um, if you found something like that, you'd be hard-pressed, because natural selection can't do that. Um, if you found a lot of that, you'd be hard-pressed to think, and I've made all these other examples too, but we haven't found them. We haven't found any of these, so despite a million chances for us to find out that evolution was wrong, we haven't found a single one. Evolution always comes up right, and that means, as in any scientific sense that you want to accept, that evolution is true. So that's the end of the evidence part, but I just want to take a few minutes at the end to, to talk about why people don't believe it. In the book I describe, I lectured to a group of wealthy businessmen on the North Shore of Chicago who paid me a goodly sum to come up and lecture to their group about the evidence for evolution. And afterwards, one guy came up to me and said, well, Dr. Coyne, I found your, very, your evidence that you presented, some of it, which I've already presented, was very convincing, but I'm not convinced, okay? <laughs> And I just scratched my head internally, of course, and thought, well, why, can, why would somebody find convincing evidence and not be convinced? But in fact, most Americans are not convinced by evolution. This is the, oops, sorry, the belief in evolution has been static for the last um, 26 years. This is a graph showing the percentage of Americans that accept creationism, young earth creationism, or 6,000 years old, People and everything else poofed into existence. Theistic evolution, God-guided evolution. I mean, I don't even know if I count these people as believing in evolution because they say that, yeah, things evolved, but God changed things here and there. I mean, that's not evolution the way scientists understand it. And then people who believe in evolution the way, or accept evolution the way scientists do, these numbers, they've barely budged, okay, over this period. In this period of 26 years, we have had Carl Sagan, we've had Stephen Jay Gould, We've had Ed Wilson, we've had Richard Dawkins, we've had National Geographic, we've had the Animal Channels. It's not like people don't know that there's evolution out there, but they still, look at these figures are flat. And of course you don't, sorry? Um, don't know. 
Okay. Those are the people that are afraid to say they're creationists. <laughs> I don't know. That's just a guess. So, I mean, the, there's a slight and heartening uptick here from 9 to 14 percent. It's, in absolute terms, it's only a 5 percent increase, but in real terms, it's um, 5 ninths or 55, you know, um, 55 percent uh, change. But really, you know, and, I, and my book came out in 2009, but I'm sure you're not going to see a dramatic uptick <laughs> due to my book. I mean, it's, it's flat. So why is this? We know that evolution has occurred. It's a scientific fact as solid as the fact that there's atoms and that infectious diseases are caused by bacteria. Why is this? Well, you know why it is. Why are we here? Why are we next to the bottom? There's a simple one-word answer which people hate to hear because although it's true, it's invidious to many people, and that's this, which is religion. Um, the reason why we have opposition to evolution in this country and not in the other countries is because we are an extraordinarily religious nation. In fact, of all first world countries, we are the most religious. Now, it may seem stupid for me to tell you that creationism comes from religion, because you know that. I have never met a creationist in my life who was not motivated by religion. And they'll tell you that. And the churches will say, we don't believe in evolution because it contravenes scriptures. Or Muslims will say it contravenes the Quran. So if you just listen to what people say about evolution, you will know that the opposition that we have to acceptance of evolution is not due to Americans being stupid or being unexposed to the evidence. It's due to the fact that they have another belief system which prevents them from accepting evolution and that is religion. Now, I, I know we have a, a fairly well-off liberal crowd here, and when I debate liberal theologians, I'm surprised at how little they really know about how religious Americans really are. So I want to talk about how religious, very briefly, Americans really are, because that's what's preventing us from understanding evolution. What proportion of people in the United States believe in the literal existence of angels? How many, what, can somebody like shout out guesses or something? Whoa, you know the data better than I do. <laughs> 63%. It goes higher if you go to hell. 70% believe in hell. 70% believe in heaven. I think 70%, well, 92% of Americans say that they believe in God. And about 75% they absolutely believe in God. If you ask them how many accept evolution, and you're being generous here because I'm including theistic evolution, 40%. Okay. These things don't exist. What Darwin said it does exist. <laughs> yes. Oh, you can't hear, is that a general problem? I'm sorry, I'll move the mic up and try to speak a little louder. Thanks for telling me. Okay, is that better? I'll try to talk louder too, okay? And if you can't hear that, then you need a hearing aid. <laughs> um, okay, so this is, this is what we're facing. Six, six, um, belief in, this is belief in angels. 63% of the people that you see, not necessarily walking around Harvard Square, but just taking a cross-section of American believe in angels, okay? Why is evolution such, such a, um, so strongly opposed by religion? Well, you know why it is. First of all, evolution, it doesn't teach this, but it has this philosophical effect on people. It has views, effective views on origin and our specialists. We are primates descended from other primates that were sort of hairy and probably walked on their knuckles. We're not the special objects of creation, according to the theory of evolution. We're just one little branch, albeit a big-brained branch, on the tree of life, and we're no more special than a squirrel is. And I always think that to myself when I see the squirrels and walking across Harvard Yard. Um, and effective views of purpose and meaning. A lot of people will read evolution as saying, well, we have no purpose. We're just, we just descended from inorganic molecules 3.5 billion years ago. Life has no meaning. I'm going to shoot myself if you're, if you're Camus or something. <laughs> but, I mean, this is true. This is what these people say, and this is what creationists will tell you, why they don't like evolution. And finally, it's effect on morality. Um, if morality was not handed down by God, then why don't we just behave like beasts? Because we evolved from beasts. Okay. So for these reasons and many others, religion does not like evolution. Unlike any other branch of science, save perhaps cosmology. Evolution hits our, our feeling of solipsism in the solar plexus. It just says we're just highly evolved um, rotifers, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so here, I mean, I shouldn't have to try to convince people that, that religion is the cause of anti-evolutionism in America because it's so palpably obvious. 
But when I do that, there are many people whom I call faithists who don't necessarily believe in God themselves, but think that religion is a good thing because it keeps the masses down, it keeps them happy. You don't want to diss religion because so many people find it... I mean, I, don't, I, I really don't understand it. You can argue with somebody for being a Republican. You can say you're, they're stupid for being a Republican. You shouldn't have these views. And political views are held very deeply as religious views. But if you tell somebody their religious views are wrong, they don't want to hear about it. They call you strident and militant and there's something wrong with you. So when I say that religion is the cause of anti-evolutionism or anti-science in America in many ways, um, it's palpably obvious, but I have to convince people. Okay, it's not only the cause of anti-evolutionism in America, it's the cause of anti-evolutionism throughout the world. Here's a graph that I plotted where I took 32 European countries, the same 32 I showed you before, and I simply plotted on the x-axis, the degree of belief in God of the inhabitants of each country, from low God to high God beliefs. And it's basically the way they do this, I think, is how often do you pray every day to yourself? That's the index I think they use for this. And then the acceptance of evolution from the graph I showed you before. And you see this strong negative correlation here. These countries up here with high acceptance of evolution, like Denmark, Sweden, etc., um, have low belief in God. There are countries, believe it or not, where only 20% of the inhabitants believe in God. Look to Scandinavia for those. And then, as the countries become more and more religious, the um, acceptance of Darwinism goes down. This is a st highly statistically significant correlation. Where are we? Right there. Highly religious. There's Turkey, but only below us. We're highly religious. 80% here, the answer to this question. And low acceptance of evolution, about 40%. Okay, so what does this mean? You can interpret this kind of correlation in several ways. I'm almost done here, by the way. Um, first of all, you can say, well, if it's just these two factors affecting each other, maybe the more, um, the more you accept evolution going up here, the less likely you are to be religious. That is, learning about evolution turns you into an atheist. Okay, And certainly for some people, that's true. I think that happened to Darwin, for example. And certainly people who go into evolution, eventually, a lot of them, their religious belief tends to be eroded. But I think the main reason for this correlation is the other one. In fact, I know it's the other one. It's that belief in God prevents you. It puts a mental wall up between you and accepting the facts of evolution. Why do I know this? Well, I'll give you a statistic in a minute. But many people get their religion. In fact, everybody gets their religion before they get their Darwin. So those barriers to accepting evolution are instilled in you by your parents or your peers or your church before you get to understand evolution, and they prevent you from understanding it. So I think, and there's possibly an uncorrelated third variable here. In fact, I know there is, but this shows you that I think that acceptance of religion is a palpable and important force in blocking acceptance of evolution. What it means, of course, is that me standing up here and telling you about the vestigial bones of the little whale is not going to do crap. Right? <laughs> because if you are determined by your faith not to believe that, then no matter what I tell you, you're not going to. And this, here's some proof for it. This is a Time Magazine poll taken in 2006 that generally asked Americans, if science found a fact that contradicted the tenets of your faith, what would you do? So you have a choice. You accept the fact, despite the fact that it contravenes your religion. You you accept your faith and deny the fact, in other words, you're perverse, or you get cognitive dissonance. Um, okay. okay, so here's the answer. Uh, what percentage of Americans would reject the fact in favor of their faith? What, you, what is your guess? What the, how many? You people are really cynical. <laughs> in fact, it's 64%. Okay, but look, at that's a frightening figure. 64% of Americans will reject a scientific fact if it goes against the dictates of their faith. If this doesn't tell you why evolution is not accepted in America, because the Bible tells you that evolution didn't occur, then I don't know what does. Okay. So, okay, so what's the conclusion from this? Well, if you want people to accept the fact, the sort of conclusion that you would draw is, well, you've got to get them to reject their faith. In other words, get rid of religion. One, a famous professor told me the other day, if I had my way, I would shoot everybody in this country that's religious. I won't name <laughs> him slash her because you'd have to wear a Kevlar vest. Her, she would have to wear a Kevlar vest. Um, but it is, it is the fact that I think that the, the root, that what this mandates is that if we really want evolution to be accepted by Americans, we have to loosen the grip of religion on their minds. At least those forms of religion, not all forms of religion, but those forms of religion that make people resistant to evolution. And it's not just fundamentalists. 
29% of Catholics, which is a faith that's officially designated as accepting evolution because the Pope said evolution is okay. 29% of Catholics are young earth creationists. Okay. So it's not just the fundamentalists. It's religion in general, even those so-called mainstream or even liberal faiths. People just don't like it because it doesn't make them feel special. Okay, so how do we get rid of religion, if you want to do that? <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't advocate shooting people that are religious. That's a violation of the First Amendment. <laughs> um, um, I believe in persuasion. Um, but I don't think you can just do it by saying, well, your faith is foolish. Because there are reasons why people are religious. There are reasons why Americans are more religious than other countries. We're not dumber than Swedes or Danes, so why are we more religious than Swedes or Danes? And I think the answer is that America is a far more dysfunctional society. And that may strike you as something that's incongruous, but a far more dysfunctional society than Sweden or Denmark. There's a lot of work coming out in sociology now which shows that in many ways, our society compared to those societies that are A, less religious, and B, more accepting of evolution, um, our society is dysfunctional in ways that will make people become religious. Here's, just, here's one paper from last year um, by Solt et al., which just, I mean, you don't have to look at the data, but this, these are 12 different indices of religion across 71 countries of the world. Each point is a separate country. And these indices of religion on the y-axis or the vertical axis are plotted against the Gini index, Gini index, which is an index of income inequality. And in every case, there's a highly significant correlation. Those nations in which people, there's more income inequality are those nations who are more religious. Okay. And you might wonder, well, why is that? Karl Marx said the answer to that. But I don't consider myself a Marxist, but I think he was right about one thing. Not just one thing, but this thing in particular. Um, and you can show it in a better way. Um, this is why Greg Paul, um, some of you may know of his work, a sociologist, he calculated for 17 first world countries. They're labeled by um, letters here, and I think Japan's on here as well, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, um, Ireland, Great Britain, et cetera. Um, he took for each of these countries a measure of how healthy their society was, and he calls this a successful society scale. And it combines things like availability of medical care, infant mortality, corruption, um, drug usage, uh, venereal disease, income inequality, other indices which sociologists take as being in indicative of an unhealthy society, and combine them into what he called the successful society scale, which goes from zero to a really bad society to 10, a really healthy society. And then for each of these, these 17 countries, he plotted how successful their societies were, how high they are in the scale, with how many purport, what proportion of the people believed in God in those countries. That's the correlation. It's a pretty strong correlation, and it's highly statistically significant. The more uh, inhabitants of a country believe in God, the less successful their society is, and vice versa. There we are. We have the highest religious belief and the least successful society. We, we're, we're pretty well off compared to some of these places. But we have huge degrees of income and inequality. We don't have good health care. We have high child mortality. We have too many people incarcerated. If you combine those into this supposedly objective index, we're, we're down pretty low. So there's a negative correlation between religious belief and how successful your society is. Okay, now why is that? So we have, we have a complicating factor here. America's religious, the re, we're religious, and that makes us reject evolution. But why are we religious as we're religious? Because at least according to sociological theory, we're dysfunctional. <laughs> And why is that? Why do we get this correlation? Well, there's two ways to explain this. First, you can say, well, the more people that believe, whoops, sorry, we'll get rid of Darwin for the time. The more people that believe in God, um, the less successful your society is because religious people make their societies less successful. Now, you can make, I mean, you can make stories about that, about the Taliban. You can make stories about Republicans, for example, and things like that. Yeah, I mean, you can see my political affiliations. I'm, it's too late for me to hide them um, in this talk. <laughs> But I don't think that's the reason for this. I think that the reason, and the sociologists who do these correlations think that, that the reason is, that, and of course Marx thought the reason was as well, that if you live in a society which is basically dysfunctional and unhealthy and you see people doing better than you and you can't go to the doctor and get medical care and there's corruption and a lot of people are in jail, you need solace and support somewhere. If you can't get it from your society, you get it from the, the man in the sky. Religion is the opiate of the masses, the sigh of an oppressed people. Okay, so 
the ultimate conclusion, and this is the end of my tale about evolution, we're a long way from hind limbs and horses here, but I've taught evolution for 30 years and I just got frustrated by not being able to make headway in the education of many people. The thing that blocks the American acceptance of evolution is religion. I firmly believe that because there is no such thing as a non-religious creationist. You can have religions without creationism. You do not have creationism in the world anywhere without religion. The conclusion that it is, we were not going to make headway in getting people to accept evolution in this country until we become less religious. Now you're going to say, religion's here to stay. Can't happen. My answer to that is two words, Sweden, Denmark. <laughs> okay. 300 years ago, deeply religious societies. Most of Europe was. Most of Europe now is far more, far less religious in America. It can be done. Okay. Um, so, if you want people to accept Darwin, the conclusion is, make them less religious. How do you make them less religious? You don't go saying your religion is stupid. You create a kind of society in which religion is no longer needed as a form of solace. You create a society which is more just, which is more equal, and which is more caring. And regardless of how you feel about religion, I think that that's one goal that all of us can agree on. Thanks very much. Sorry.